Hi, my name is Lisa Martin. I am the mother of a child with special needs. He has Fragile X Syndrome. In many respects, he has been my teacher. He has made me be a more caring, compassionate, better human being. What we have learned together on our journey, I have realised the difficulties and challenges that parents of special needs children face are wide and varied. During my years of facilitating courses for parents and professionals, I have met some wonderful people who have shared with me their stories of great joy and sadness, who have experienced the good, the bad and the ugly of all aspects of life bringing up their special children. I am passionate about empowering parents who are dedicated in helping their children with additional needs. You are invited to my podcast. I will be talking about all things in our special world of disability and additional needs. I will be interviewing other parents of children with special needs, as well as professionals and people in the community who are offering services that help. Sometimes these podcasts might touch an emotional nerve and upset you. Other times they might fill you with joy and empower you. I don't mean to make you angry or upset, but we need to get a wider audience listening and talking about disability. Only when this happens, I believe disability won't be feared as it is today. Hello, I'm introducing Maria to the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, welcome and I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Um, so tell me a little bit of background on, on you um, before you had your children. You, you worked with children with SEN, didn't you? I have, yes I have. I kind of fell into it by chance. Um, I worked as a nanny for many different families and um, after a while um, I kind of got working with families who had mainstream children and special needs children. Um, having worked with special needs children I found I had a really really close bond, really good understanding and I actually found it very rewarding which kind of led me on the path of working with special needs only and seeking out those kind of positions. Oh, that sounds really nice. Um, so you said you were working with a Down syndrome boy. Um, how did you create a positive relationship with them? You, you just connected. That was really not very difficult. He was very loving. He loved cuddles. He was just like amazing, like a little teddy bear. And he just needed someone who would allow him to be the way he was at the age that he was. So maybe like functioning at a two-year-old level, um, mentally, physically, emotionally, um, being eight years old actually, and being quite large for his age. Um, he just wanted someone to love him and he just wanted to be, you know, looked after. Wow, oh, that's so lovely. Um, and then you said that you had a friend who had two children with ASD, is that right? That's correct, so my best friend um, who couldn't come to my wedding because she was having her baby. It was not a good time, I wasn't gonna ready to forgive her for that so quickly. But anyway, she had her baby and at about 16 months old um, he was diagnosed with autism. Um, that was back in uh, 2000 and uh, he was quite a severe case and it was quite obvious from very early on um, and then she had a second baby um, they were 18 months apart and then he was diagnosed with autism as well at 18 months old she wanted to go back to work she found it very difficult to find childcare for the two of them and that's when she approached me saying there's no one else I'd rather have look after my kids than you, you have the experience, I'll help you with the training, please come on board and so I did. Oh brilliant, so what type of training did you, did you do so you could um, support the children with ASD? So funny enough my friend was working for a National Autistic Society and they were running some training courses and she used to sign me up for different things 
uh, just things like awareness, what kind of behaviour to expect, um, how to help. Um, I remember back in those days, they, they were still teaching how to restrain a child safely and successfully. Um, so I had training in that, even though they don't use that anymore. Mm. Um, just things like that, really. And did you have to use safe. that at all? Yes, I did with her children. I did. They yeah. they were nonverbal, very physical, um, very active, and uh, quite aggressive. Right. Okay. And how how did that make you feel working with them children? It sounds quite challenging. Um, it was very challenging. Um, it was a Monday to Friday job. I got to go home and I got to relax. And my thoughts were really with my friend who had to deal with that any other given day because it was two of them and it was really, really full on. Um, but I actually enjoyed working with them because uh, having spent four years with them, I could see the difference we were all making, not, not just myself and their mum, but other professionals involved. And they started showing signs of... Um, you know, much more pleasant character and much more easily manageable in the public. Oh, that's good. That's really good. And I bet you you really helped as well um, because it's having consistency as well in these children's lives and and know what you're doing and and I think I think they can feel as well if you if you like them or not. And it they sounds can. Like you did. Yeah. Yeah. I think what is what was very important for their mother, uh, which was uh, quite surprising to me, but now I understand it, is my tasks were quite simple. Take him to a shop to buy one item. That we practiced that for months, for months every day. We went to the shop, we bought one item, and we came back home. And I couldn't understand at the time why that was so important. But to integrate them into society and to teach them that, you know, outside world is okay. Um, if you isolate children like that and just keep them at home and provide care in home or in specialist school, then the chances of them being rehabilitated into the outside world are much, much more difficult later. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so learning life skills is really important. And I think that, yeah, she knew what she was doing, um, that mummy, because I think just doing one item is doable, isn't it? Yes. Because that builds self-esteem. Where if you're trying to get them to do the weekly shop and yes. the sensory overload and it's just too long waiting, it, it's just too much. And then they get that memory of not wanting to continue shopping. So yeah, that was brilliant. And then did it move up to buying two items and then maybe moving buying three items and <laughs> that that was quite funny yes so after six months of going to buy one item every day we went to the shop every day and we bought one item every day um what we found difficult was adding on another item mm -hmm. because on a monday he would always buy an apple on a tuesday he would always buy a small bag of haribos on a wednesday you know it, it was a particular item on a particular day so when it came to add something on it was very confusing for them both the older one more so than the younger one but we got there so you know we, it, it was almost like starting all over again but with two items now right and the confusion the the uncertainty and and the anxiety but again and this time it took three months to add on the extra item yeah and it's because they get used to that routine don't they yes. um sounds like you did a wonderful wonderful job so so tell me so you've you've got two children of your own now um and they both have um sen as well don't they so yeah. tell me a little bit about that tell me about um, the oldest one first. So um, my oldest son, um, his name is William, he's 10 and uh, he's got a genetic condition called 22q11.2 deletion syndrome which is quite a bit of a mouthful. Um, it comes with a you know variety of difficulties that go along with that. Uh, there are some other terms that some professionals will use like bellocardiofacial syndrome or the George syndrome depending which way it goes because that particular deletion uh, can go in two directions. Uh, one that affects 
breathing, heart, uh, intestines, and the other one that has more facial features and, and other issues. So, hence, there are two names for that one particular mm. condition. Wow. He's also got ASD as well, hasn't he? Autism spectrum disorder. Yes, so um, he was diagnosed with ASD um, when after his uh, genetic um, diagnosis. Um, I think they noticed the traits in him and there is research that suggests that uh, autism is very, very strongly linked to that particular chromosome, the 22Q chromosome. Right. And whereas most children with 22Q deletion will have some autistic traits, not all of them will have a diagnosis of autism. It depends how strong they are. Right. So how old was he when he got his um, ASD diagnosis? So he was about two and a half. Oh wow, so that is a really early diagnosis. Very early. early. Yeah. Yes. Um, so how did, you, how did you feel about that when you got the, um, the genetic deletion and, and then the ASD? Um, with the genetic deletion, um, it took a long time to get a diagnosis. To me, it wasn't important what the diagnosis was. To me, it was important to get recognition that I knew something was wrong with my baby. I knew something was wrong with my son, but I, I kind of felt like no one actually believed me. So when that first initial diagnosis came through, I just felt relieved. I know it might sound weird, but I was just relieved. I was just like, wow, finally. Uh, so I didn't think too much about what it meant. It was just such a relief to know that I'm not imagining things and that now they know what it is. Hopefully they can help him and help us yeah. <clears throat> in, the, yeah. in the further care. Because you'd worked with other children with SEN and you'd had lots of training, you, you, you knew what to look for, didn't you? Um, didn't you realise before he had his diagnosis that he, he had heart problems? I did. So um, going back to the little boy with Down syndrome whom I looked after, he had heart problems as well. And uh, there were certain things that I noticed on him that I was noticing on my own baby. Uh, difficulty feeding, excessive sweating, um, that, that is not normal for a baby. And it's, it's a very, very normal sign of a child with a heart problem. Uh, but having gone to my GP, I was literally laughed out of surgery, saying it's hot, all babies sweat. Um, yeah, being told I'm a paranoid first-time mother, and to just try and relax. Wow. Mm. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're going potty, doesn't it? When you, because a, a, a parent's instinct, you just know, don't you? And the parent knows their child better than than anybody, even the doctor. So then you were proved right. Um, he, he's got a hole in his heart, hasn't he, William? Yes, he took six months to get the referral, which was me going every week to the GP um, like a crazy woman, saying, something's wrong, can't you just refer us? Mm. And um, after a few months of me doing that, I think she just really got fed up of me and gave me a referral to Great Ormond Street. So when we went there and he was his heart was scanned and they said, oh yes, he's got a hole in his heart. Wow. That's why his heart wasn't working properly. That's why he was sweating when feeding and having difficulties. Everything that, that you said, everything you knew. Yes, yes. How did that make you feel, Maria? Angry. Yeah. Very, very yes. angry. Yes, yeah. I was very angry. It took a lot of people to convince me not to go back to the GP and give a piece of my mind. Mm, yeah, I bet, yeah. And so how about when you got the ASD diagnosis as well? Because you said you, you coped with the genetic deletion, um, you know, really well by the sounds of it. Yes, so that was more a relief and kind of like... Um, you know, okay, now we can see what we can do. ASD was very unexpected for me, even though now I realize it's very closely linked with that particular genetic condition. Oh yeah, so the ASD um, diagnosis, that came as a bit of a shock to you, didn't it? Uh, at a time, yes, it was um, 
quite a huge shock um, um, even though now I realize that it's very closely linked in with the 22Q um, but at the time I I just I, I didn't I was feeling numb I was feeling oh my gosh this is so unfair is one diagnosis not enough what else are you gonna throw at me and also having work with children with ASD who were on a severe end of the spectrum, non-verbal and, and very, very uh, challenging, I suddenly lost all hope for his future. So that was a very worrying time. Yeah. You go through a grieving process, don't you? Um, because even though you, your child is still alive, um, you, you've got all of these dreams and aspirations for the child that, that is going to be. And then you get a diagnosis like that and you kind of grieve that, that child that is never going to be in, in mm. your mind. But, but tell me a bit about William because he, he's not on the severe end of the spectrum, is he? And he's, he's not aggressive at all, is he? Um, so, yes, I mean, w William was uh, my first um, live-born child. Um, he, he had a twin. The twin passed away during the pregnancy. Um, he was uh, my fifth pregnancy, so we had four angel babies before that. It took us ten years to get him, so he was meant to be perfect. And I felt cheated. I really, really felt cheated that it took me so long to get my baby, uh, that we lost the twin that he had, and then for him to come, this, all these issues and problems. For a long time, I, I felt very bitter about it. But now when I look at him, I think I could not have wished for a better, lovely, gorgeous boy. He's um, happy, generally. He's very happy. He's friendly, sometimes overly friendly. He is um, just a joy to be with. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's a nice company. He's 10 now, and he loves to chat. and. He he likes to try and play jokes as well, which he doesn't always get right, but he tries. Oh. <laughs> and uh, he has lots of friends. He's very popular at school, and all the teachers love him. So who wouldn't want a child like that? Oh, that's lovely. Um, so tell me about Reese, your second child. Tell me about Reese. So Reese was um, our planned baby who happened literally the second we decided to try. So having had 10 years of trying to get William, we thought we might have to wait years to get another one. So we decided to try straight away and bam, there was Reese <laughs> straight away. And as quickly as he was created, uh, that's how quickly he came out into the world and he hasn't stopped since. <laughs> yeah, he's on the go 24/7. He's he's always doing something and he's he's just a whirlwind. Yeah. So, what diagnosis has Reese got? So, Reese currently is is just getting his diagnosis of ADHD confirmed. It has been pretty obvious to us from early age that he was a very active child. However, they do grow out of it sometimes. By the time he was five, we thought this is not changing. If anything, it's getting worse. He was not doing well at school. Um, he was not able to concentrate or sit down. He wants to please. He's the kind of child who really wants to please, but is not able to listen and do as he's told, purely due to his impulse and, and, and the behavior that just takes over. So... Um, He's also severely dyslexic and uh, things at school were not going well for him at all and the lack of understanding for a child without diagnosis meant that he was labelled as lazy and naughty. So he was distracting the class, the others in the yes. class as well. Yes. Um, so that sounds very much ADHD. Um, yeah. so, so what happened? Did you, did you go and get a, did you do a Connors test? Is that where it is? So uh, we were referred to the ADHD clinic when he was five and a half and at the time I was told that he's showing all the signs of ADHD but due to his young age they don't like to diagnose because there's still chance that some children 
are just emotionally immature and they do grow out of it, which I understood and I was happy with that. But he is nearly nine now and we are just getting the diagnosis now. I think the process yeah. took way too long. He should That's have helped the diagnosis and help. Yeah. So have you not been able to get as much support for Reese because he hasn't had that diagnosis? Unfortunately, that is correct. Yeah. Um, I don't like labels on children. I, I think I'm not the kind of mother who is running around saying, oh, I want, I want the, this diagnosis, I want that diagnosis, uh, which is what I have been accused of at times. Um, I just want the help for him. And unfortunately, with the way the system is at the moment, no diagnosis means no help. So we couldn't even apply for the EHCP, um, the, the education and health plan, because there was nothing to put down there. What are his needs? All the school could put down was he doesn't listen, he's naughty, he doesn't do as he's told, and that's it. That is not a SCN issue, apparently, un unless wow. you have a label to it. Wow, so do mm. you feel that you've been trying to fight the system to get your child's needs and, and get some support for quite a long time, by the sounds of it? Absolutely, yes. Um, and again, it all goes back to these labels and, and little, you know, holes where they try to fit these children in. One size does not fit all and sometimes there's a cubby hole and they want your child to fit in it and the child just doesn't fit. So in, in most of his tests and, and, and reviews and observations at school, he would tick many boxes and then he would not tick some and that prolonged the process because they felt he wasn't ticking every single box on the list that they wanted to tick in order to give him the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that makes it very hard because not every child will have every single yeah, of course. tick. So. Everyone's unique, aren't they? That's yes. what makes the world an interesting place. Mm -hmm. So do both of your boys go to a mainstream or a special school? So they're both in mainstream school. Um, William, he's got, um, he had his statement to begin with, which was then converted to the EHCP. Um, he, he gets help and support from school. Uh, Reese, unfortunately, uh, doesn't have um, EHCP. Uh, since he was diagnosed with severe dyslexia, I have had to take him out of his mainstream school in order for him to receive appropriate education for his dyslexia at a specialist dyslexia school every Monday because oh, wow. the school said they can't cope with him and they can't provide what he needs. Yeah, because mm -hmm. he hasn't got the educational health care plan as well, is that correct? Well, they just said they, they, they don't have any specialist dyslexia teachers and that they cannot um, teach him if that's what he needs, mm -hmm. which is what he needed because mm -hmm. he was year three and not able to read even you know, sing, single word, like dog or cat. Yeah. So did you find that specialist school then? And did you have to push for that to happen? Uh, so I found a specialist school, yes. Uh, what? It, it's a private school, so I had to fund it myself. Uh, when I did approach um, the education department about funding for him, they said they don't do that. Uh, when I asked them about specialist provisions for dyslexic children, they said that the only one currently like that is in Putney and they don't place Islington children in that school anymore and they haven't done, they haven't done so for the last 10 years. Mm. So yes, I had to basically fund it myself, find it myself and just take care of it myself but he can read now, so it was all worth it. That's brilliant. So what's helped him read? Um, what, does he wear the glasses with the coloured lens? Or tell me a little bit about um, dyslexia. I, I don't know much about it, really. So uh, Reese's dyslexia is on quite severe end of the spectrum. Uh, dyslexia can affect different people differently, and every child or person with dyslexia will have their own unique way of learning. Mm. For some people, coloured or overlays or coloured glasses help, um, or or like reading on an um, iPad, uh, dimming the colours or changing the colours around or changing the font. Um, with Reese, none of those things seem to affect him. 
Reese's problem is that his brain jumbles the letters up, so he cannot right. follow the sequence like the ogre would be dog. Um, in his head, he sees it as ogre, the or wow. yeah, just jumble. He doesn't see the sequence, wow. which again also leads to him having problems with uh, following through instructions because the sequencing is all wrong. Right, okay, mm -hmm. that does make sense. Yeah. Because um, I understand the sensory processing disorder and it's a similar thing with sequen sequen sequencing in that sometimes as well. It's yes. like organising um, what comes first. Yes. You know. Ah, that's really interesting. So what what helped him to be able to read then? What, what was the... Um, what did they teach him? How did they teach him to read? So uh, they use uh, phonics um, and they use uh, special cards uh, that would help a child to recognize a letter uh, by a picture rather than by a sound or meaning first. Um, he was, he did make progress but he was very, very slow. His dyslexia teacher was the first one to point out that in, in her uh, opinion he does um, have um, ADHD because he's not able to focus for long enough to learn a word. By the time he sounds out the last few letters of a word, he would have forgotten what the first few were, was, which to her was quite unheard of, unless the child has severe issues with concentration. Mm. So she alerted me to that um, mm. as well. So it was impacting his learning as well as his behavior. Yeah, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. So, due to his ADHD, have you decided any medication, go down the medication route for him? or uh, Because it, it's personal, isn't it? Some people do go down that route, some people don't. And there's no right and no wrong, it's what, what suits that family. Yeah, I, I, th um, I think when it comes to the medication, there is no right or wrong, there is only what's right for you. Mm. Um, I haven't thought about medication yet. Um, Reese is a very impulsive uh, child who surprises me every day. I would hate for him to lose that. At the same time, I know it's creating problems and it's uh, hindering his learning. So uh, my thoughts are when he starts secondary school, if he's still having such severe issues, um, I would talk to more people and educational psychologist and see whether there's other ways that we can help his learning or whether medicating is the only way forward. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't say no definitely, but I'm saying no at the moment. It's a really tricky thing to get your head around, isn't it, mm. medication. Um, I can remember watching a documentary um, before I had my child with the additional needs and seeing, um, I think it was quite severe, um, children on the autistic spectrum. Mm. And, and the parents on that program were saying that they medicated their child and I was thinking that's outrageous but actually when when you do have a child that, that needs medication or you know the offer of medication is there it's having what you've already learned in your head <laughs> you yes. know you need to kind of get rid of that because it's almost like you know if your child had a physical um, disability or something that they uh, they need medication to help them with a, a physical illness you wouldn't think twice. No, if they have so, a broken leg, you would have a cast put on. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But, but it is. It's. It's. A, I still struggle with it, and my child is on medication, and it it took me a really long time to decide that, and I went on chat rooms about the particular medication that he's on, um, spoke to loads of people, the pros, the cons, the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm. um, because what happens as well? Because one medication might be great for one child and then your child might yes. might have it and then it just doesn't suit that particular child so it's it's kind of playing trial and error isn't it as well it with is. the medication so some it, medications can also have the opposite effect mm -hmm. uh, my older child william uh, when he was four years old he was put on diazepam now that is wow. a very very strong drug and it was given to him in hope that he might reduce um, the cramps in his legs. He had severe cramps in his legs and really, really severe insomnia. He hardly slept. He'd sleep 15, 20 minutes and then be awake for hours and then another 15, 20 minutes. 
the first, it, it took them six months to convince me to just try it. And when I did try it, it sent him completely hyper wow. and completely through the roof. He, he was just oh. like, high as a kite and a really, really energetic and aggressive. So wow. it, it had completely different effect to what it's meant to be. And it was due apparently to a low dosage. So they suggested I increase the dosage. And when I gave him the higher dosage, um, he was much better with it. So he did calm down. He did get a little bit more sleep. The cramps did stop. But having read up about it and spoken to my chemist, realizing how addictive that drug is, I decided to take him off it. Wow. And we decided to go down the natural route of osteopath. Ah, and okay. And did that help with his sleep? Absolutely, yes. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. It worked for us. I know it doesn't work for everyone, but for us yeah. it worked. It was and great. that's what it's all about, isn't it? Finding what works for you and your family. And, yes. it, and it might look very different to what, what something works for the next family. Yes. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, because I, I I had craniosacral therapy for Iggy as mm -hmm. well. And that, that really helps it as helps. well, doesn't it? That's um, good. So, how did you feel about, um, you know, getting Reese's diagnosis after all of these years, really? You know, still fighting for it, really. <laughs> yeah. I think having been through what we've been through with William now that, uh, you know, we're trying to sort Reese out as such, I just keep thinking, you know, it will happen. Don't stress, don't rush. They can't, you know, withhold it forever. I feel a little bit like a pro at the moment. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, even if he doesn't get it, I know what I need to do. Um, so yeah. it's not as scary second time around as it was the first time. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing an amazing job, Maria. Mm. Um, it's just so difficult when you go through it at the beginning, isn't it? And you and you get all of these professionals and GPs and people like that blaming your lack of parenting skills when actually yes. everything you said right from the beginning is is what's going on. It, isn't it, it? Yes, I, I was spot on from day one, and uh, they made me feel like I'm paranoid and even referred me to social services because they had concerns. Um, really? Yes, not in so many words, but, you know, they, they, their concerns were that I'm making things up in order to get attention, which so is Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen no by proxy. No one ever used that, that particular... Yeah. But they, they did inform social services because I was able to see my social services files and I was able to see the GP's referral saying she fears the mother's suffering, postnatal depression, slight paranoia, and she's worried um, that I'm running to, to the doctor every week because I don't know what to do with my child because I'm not wow. coping. Yes. Well, that is really shocking, Maria. Um, I'm actually meeting quite a lot of parents that have had similar experiences mm. with this Munchausen by proxy. Um, and it's just outrageous because basically, being a tiger mummy, you're just fighting for your child's rights and wanting to get to the bottom of it. You want to support and help your child. Yes. But then by doing that, you're getting you're getting accused of one child by yes. proxy. Yes. What well, what did they expect you to just sit back and just you know? I don't know what they expected. I think they found it quite unbelievable that at a couple of weeks old, I was convinced there's something wrong with my child because he only was a few weeks old at the time when I noticed. Mm. He also had submucous cleft palate, which made it impossible for him to latch on and breastfeed. Mm. And I was made feel like the world's worst mother because I didn't breastfeed. But it was physically impossible for him. I know that now and I learned that later, but at the time I didn't know. And I had to go with the bottles, and then he really struggled with the bottles, and it was just, uh, yeah, and it was very obvious that he's not quite right, but no one believed me. And being a new mum as well, I bet you loads of feelings of guilt were coming up that you couldn't breastfeed, and did you feel like that? I 
probably cried for the first six months every single day, every time I made a bottle for him because I felt guilty that I couldn't breastfeed him because that was my plan all along. Yeah. I didn't have a bottle in the house or sterilize or anything. I had to go and make my husband go and get these things that we needed because breastfeeding failed and I never even... No one talks to you about possibility that breastfeeding might not work. No one yeah. tells you that. Yeah. They just say, you just, you just do it. It's yeah. what women are meant to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It didn't come natural to me either. It's yeah. just it's because it's Iggy not. had a tongue tie, but there nobody spotted it. There you go. And he and he's got a really high palate because of the fragile leg syndrome. And um and the sucking as well. He yes. wasn't able to do. So um, can't let chance. So. But, but when that happens, when you the mum of a, your first child and you've got all these dreams and aspirations of being a perfect mum, and then all of a sudden you're not this perfect mum. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, it's hard, isn't it? I felt guilty for ages, and I felt, I felt like I was failing as, as a mother. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah. I also, on top of everything else, I felt like in my professional life, I never had any problems that I couldn't solve. I looked after every child to the best of my ability and never felt like I've let them down as much as I've let down my own child. And looking back now, I do understand and realise I didn't let him down, but at the time, that's what it felt like. Yeah. I yeah. got it wrong. Oh, Marie, that's awful that you felt like that. Um, so tell me, I know you were saying you have... Sleep, well, you did have sleepless nights. Does that still happen sometimes? Yes. Yeah. William has been diagnosed uh, at age of five with, with severe insomnia. Right. So, yeah, he, he went for a couple of sleep studies. Mm. Uh, Great Ormond Street first, then he was referred to Evelina Children's Hospital, where one of the best top sleep specialists works. And after reviewing William, he just said, unfortunately, he's just one of those kids who has insomnia. So we just learn to live with it now. That must really affect you and, and your um, equilibrium. You know, just, I know what it's like because, you know, Iggy, Iggy's up sometimes. When he's got high anxiety, he's up all night. And you just can't, I mean, I don't think I should have even been driving, to be honest. Mm. It, it's like torture. It Lack is. of sleep is like torture, it and is. then having to continue and look after two children and keep keep the house and just survive. Mm. That's what it's like, just surviving, isn't it? Just surviving, yes, yes. Mm. I mean, they use uh, um, you know lack of sleep as a form of torture <laughs> in, yeah. in, in in you know wherever. So it, it it was hard. I think it's getting a little bit easier now that he's a bit older. Mm. And he can follow simple instructions of, okay, you wake up, but you stay in your room. There's nothing in his room that can harm him. Mm. So he's got books, pens, paper. Um, he can, you know, pretty much read or play with his soft toys. Um, we had to make sure that he is safe. And sometimes I can hear him peter pattering through the house. Uh, I can hear him when he goes to the toilet or when he goes to get some water. I'm, I'm half asleep, but I'm aware of all the noise and sounds, and it's it's hard. But I think I've learned to sleep with one eye open. That's just the way I sleep now. I can well, hear everything, yeah. but I am asleep. Yeah, it's like being on high alert mm. on a daily basis, isn't yes. it? And it's it's having chronic stress on a daily basis, having a child with additional needs, True. I believe. And that affects our health as yes, well. Yes, yes, it does. So have, have you had any health implications, you think, because of... Um, all of the stress that you've been under? I think um, I, I did develop depression, uh, but uh, it wasn't what they thought to begin with, postnatal depression. My depression developed later on when they were, you know, toddlers, just before preschool. Um, I think it was because people kept asking me, when are you going back to work? When are you going back to work? And uh, I, I couldn't answer and I felt like maybe they thought I'm just too lazy and I don't want to go to work. But there was no way of me that I could sort out childcare for my two children with such high need or find someone that I trust enough. Trust was a big issue as well. Um, I think that that's what started off my depression, feeling useless because I can't go out and work and earn my own money and 
Yeah, so yes, depression developed from, from the whole situation. Um, but um, I'm getting on better now. I'm trying to get my life back together. I feel like my life was on pause from the moment of diagnosis, or rather from the moment that I gave birth to William to now. Um, Reese is nearly nine. William has just turned 10. Um, I feel like maybe slowly now I can try and reclaim my life outside of their circle and their needs. Yeah, it, so. ta- it does take a really long time, it does. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I was saying about the grieving process when you have a child with additional needs, you kind of need to grieve them. But equally, I think we need to grieve the life that we haven't got anymore as well because yes. everything is on hold, isn't it? And nothing's about us anymore. You know, there's yes. not just compromising. It's basically like just living for your children, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Everything is just all about them. You mm-hmm. lose your identity. You lose who you are. You lose your interests. You lose your friends, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And um, I just took it all on the chin and made the most of it. Uh, but now I'm kind of ready to step back into the working world. Brilliant. I'm really pleased to hear that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for sharing your story. Um, I just think you were doing an amazing job. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Lovely you. talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. To find out more about what I do, visit www.specialworldtraining.com and follow us on our Facebook page, Special World Training. Instagram and LinkedIn. I believe knowledge is power and strength is in numbers and if more people get involved in our special world we can all make our world a better place. Join me next week for more amazing stories from the good, the bad and the ugly.